So today we are doing a video, we're gonna do one of these accent wall things. Now everybody on the internet's been doing time-lapse videos and showing how wonderful their little designs are and how you can put little sticks of wood on the wall, but no one's showing you actually how to do it. We're gonna take it from this to this. When you live in a four season climate, you've got to take into account that this is an exterior wall and it moves in the winter time with frost, all right? You can't just stick things on the wall and be haphazard. You got to have a system so you don't have expansion and contraction issues letting this paint show up behind the wood later on. So we're going to go through every step so that we can transform the space. It's easy to do. It's a level two project, all right? Piece of cake. Let's face it, everybody in the world who buys a new house, and this is my daughter's house, full disclosure, beautiful and boring. They give you a beautiful house and then they leave all the work up to you because they put a non-washable cheap paint on the walls and then they hand you the keys. So now we got a brand new house. We got to paint the whole darn thing. We're going to start with this bedroom and do an accent wall and then we'll work from there. So the first step that you're going to want to take advantage of in this scenario is doing the math, right? The part that everybody hates. But here's a really simple system for you. If you go with the idea that you're going to have a long wall and this wall is just a little over 16 feet okay and what we're doing is I'm gonna just we're gonna make uh, four boxes and then four smaller boxes underneath so here's the deal this red line we're gonna call that the baseboard okay and then up here is the ceiling every one of these gaps is gonna be six inches all right, so I measure out the room. I came up with like some crazy 163 inches or something. And when I break that down into, into five gaps at six inches, take it off the total distance. And that gives you the, this number here. It gives you the width of every box. So I got 163, I got five gaps, minus 30 inches, divide that. That gives me the number for the, the total amount of trim and divided by four gives you the measurement. Piece of cake, same with the height. You take your, your ceiling height from the baseboard, one, two, three gaps, minus 18 inches, all right? And then you just have to draw a line somewhere here, like we did with our laser level, and boom, this line here is the one we're gonna work with. So we're gonna measure from here to the ceiling, minus six, and then from here to the floor, minus 12. That gives me the, this bracket and this bracket. And then it's just a matter of figuring out how many pieces you need, and then you can, Go to the store, a lot of times these trims come in 14 feet, not 16. So if you cut it in half, it's a seven foot piece of material. Now at, at an eight foot ceiling with three six inch gaps, every seven foot material will do a whole side. All right? And as it turns out, it's um, uh, 41 inches or something like that for my width. Every seven foot piece of material gives you two pieces of width. So it's really easy to do the math. And if your math isn't working out quite, quite well, then you're gonna to have to buy a whole bunch of more material or waste it. Then just make your boxes a little bit bigger. Maybe go to a seven inch gap. Nice and simple, okay? Other considerations, we have two wall plugs. One over here and one over here. So we actually set this up. The wall plugs are high enough off the ground that if we go with my six inches, the trim will pass underneath. <sighs> this is the trick with the math because you might need to adjust your gaps so that your trims aren't coming down onto the wall plug, all right? I mean, you could. You could, you could bring your trim down and do a crazy box like that and have your wall plug sitting there, but that always just gonna scream. In a bedroom, it's not a big deal if you have to because you're gonna have end tables or something to hide it, right? Great time for a basket and a couple of rolled up towels. <laughs> all right, here we go. Now, we're gonna go with all of the exterior measurements, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pre-paint my trim to the same color that I'm gonna do on the wall decoration. And here's the secret to the sauce of this whole mess. We're gonna paint the wall, we're gonna paint the trim, then when it's all dry, we're gonna cut and install it all, okay? So in the video, we're gonna show you all the cutting tricks to make sure that every piece is exactly the same. It's not that hard to do, you just have to have one simple tool. And then we're gonna show you how to install it all so that when this wall is moving and it curving and expanding and contracting through the four seasons, we're not gonna get gaps in all the caulking. One thing none of the videos that I've seen online show is how they solve the gap problem. I've got all the tricks for this video right here, okay? So you can get a great result and you're not gonna be disappointed wake up one morning on a cold day and go, oh, my wall's covered in white lines because everything's shrunk. That'd be maddening. Now, before you get started, do your math, go to the store, buy your material, bring it home, 
and then don't do anything with it until the next day. Even MDF needs to be climatized. I know a lot of people don't realize that, but there's different moisture levels, especially in different times of the year. The stores are air conditioned or heated and outside. Don't store it in your garage, okay? Bring the material into the house and especially into the room where you're gonna be working. Climatize your material before you go and install it. And that'll save you from an absolute disaster down the road. I've got my cut list, I've got my design, I got my plan, I've already got my material because I'm crazy and I just kind of figured, well, a seven foot material, it'll work. And I just went and bought what I needed. <laughs> Don't do as I do, plan in advance and then go shopping. And maybe even buy yourself an extra piece, you know, so you can avoid a trip to the store later. I'm gonna set up and paint the trims and then I'm gonna sand the wall because this is a builder grade sand paint job, which means it feels like sandpaper. <laughs> Needs to be sanded and then I'm gonna paint the wall and then we're going to just set up and get right into the installation. Well, here we are guys. This is mostly time management. I'm gonna paint all my trim. Now that the walls are done, I want it to have a good hour or so to really set up and get nice and hard so that the drying is over, okay? It won't cure for almost a month, but as long as it's dry, we can go forward with our installation. So now I'm gonna paint all the trim, set it down. It's a great time to take a break, have lunch, and then we'll come back and tie it all together. And I'm using C2 Studio Paint, okay? It's a high washability, high durability, low VOCs. Um, brilliant coverage, really good quality stuff. Now listen, I know a lot's going on with the supply out there and there are lots of paint companies that can't get their washable and durable paints on the market fast enough for the supply. Uh, this is available. We reached out and they've started shipping this by internet because this is a smaller store all around North America. So you can actually buy this stuff. We'll put the information in the video description. We got a great discount for you as well. All right, cheers. So now we're just gonna show you a simple technique for cutting all the trim exactly the same. Whenever you're doing miter cuts, you don't wanna do one piece at a time and measure and mark and cut. You wanna have a system. So what you wanna do is buy one of these tables. Okay, it's a saw stand. And at the end over here, Max, it's adjustable so that we can raise the height. We can adjust the depth of the slide. I can even adjust the arm, how far it pulls out. So I can cut up to something like five feet on the stand to the saw. Even the saw is adjustable on the bench. So you can slide it all the way left or right, whatever works for you. The point is this, having a positive stop means that if you do all the cuts up against this rail, everything you cut is exactly the same size, guaranteed. It takes all the work out of it. So I've done all my measurements, I've got my cut list. I just gotta cut these in half real quick. And now I'm gonna take all of these trims and set them up on the saw. The, the last cut that I do, okay, I wanna have it exactly 41 inches and I want it to miter this edge. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna cut every stick the opposite side first. All right? That way the cuts are done before I put it up against the saw stop. Okay? The moment of truth. Right? The moment of truth here, ladies and gentlemen. We want to be exactly 41 inches. So let's get a cut and then we'll measure. And 41, 7 16 So I did a measurement, I was a little bit long, almost half an inch. So I'm gonna take that off now. And let's measure again. Once you have the setup so it's perfect, yeah, I'm still a quarter too long. That's fine. Remember, there's no room for being wrong. We measured off the entire wall. Ooh, I'm an eighth long. Drum roll, please. Boom, 41, I loving it. Now, no one's allowed to touch the saw until I say so. Now all I have to do is just run all of these pieces through the saw with the miter joint at the other end up against the stop and it'll be perfect every time. Do this with your eyes closed. I don't recommend it. It is still a tape. It's a saw after all. <laughs> the coolest thing is using this technique, no matter how intricate and elaborate your design is, using a saw stop like this allows you to cut everything perfect. So you can do something that's eight inches long, beveled, mitered on both sides, 
and put 400 pieces on a wall, and it's going to work as long as you use this kind of a measuring and cutting system. So feel free to get as elaborate as you would like to spend your weekend. So now we're back from lunch, guys. Um, like the rule of painting, after the first coat, you got to sand. If you're a fan of the channel, you realize I, I've used Radius 360 before, and I love that tool. The folks over at Hyde, that's kind of upside down. Yeah, Hyde. They sent me this to try out. Uh, good little gizmo. I'm not going to say anything bad about it because I kind of like it. And uh, it gives me two of these, which is good because if you know me, you know I leave my tools laying around everywhere and I can never find them. So I just got to sand the wall and then we're going to jump right into uh, the rules of doing finished carpentry and how to do the task. I'm going to take it step by step in case you've never done it before. This way you have a guide that you can follow and rules that you can follow. So even if you change your design, you can be successful. All right, cheers. So first step in any wall like this, whether it's tile or carpentry, it's called symmetry. All right, bing, symmetry, which means you got to measure the wall and you got to find the midpoint. You always want to work left and right from a midpoint. Never start on one side of the room, okay? Because if your calculations are off just a little bit, it can look really stupid. If you start from the midpoint and your calculations are off, you can make adjustments as you go. At least it's a mirror-like image, okay? So. One of the things we want to do is get our midpoint and then we're going to check our plugs, the locations of our design, to make sure that it's going to be copacetic. We already know the bottom trim is going to go underneath the plugs. Little concern about the location of the wall with where they come on the side. So um, I've already done this before I did my cutting, but I'm going to go through the steps for you just so that you know how to do all this, okay? So my wall is 16 feet and four inches, all right, at the midpoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to measure off eight feet, two inches, throw a piece of tape, measure from both sides and draw a line at eight feet, two inches. And then I'll take the difference in the gap. You get yourself a good tape measure so it has stand out. That's what that is. It doesn't break on you. It makes measuring really easy. Okay, here we go. Eight feet, two inches. It's around here somewhere. Okay, now I'm going to take the tape Measure it again, and I'm going to mark my eight foot two inch mark, which is 98 inches. From the left side is right here. All right, I'll do the same over here. And it was right here, okay? It is difficult to get an exact measurement unless you're working with another person. So I just did a measurement on the floor, added a little bit for baseboards, and I was close. But this here is my center mark. All right, boom, done. Now I made this quick rig for my laser level. It's just a piece of plywood screwed to a two by four and an angle iron because my DeWalt laser level is magnetized. So I can take this wherever I wanna go and I just put a tool bag on there. Now what I've gotta do is determine this center line. I'm gonna go with my vertical line and I'm gonna just make an adjustment here. There we go, okay. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this tape, put it on the wall, in around the same height as the plugs. Now Max has got the light just a blasting here today. <laughs> so you maybe you can't see it all that great. Trust me, it's there. I can see it just fine. And I'm just going to put a little pencil mark on it. Okay, that's my center mark. Now you got to do a little bit of math because I know that my boxes are 41 inches on the corner to corner. And I know that my center line is actually a space between two boxes and we're using a six inch space. So I've got three inches plus a 41 inch box is 44 inches. 41 plus three is 44 plus another six is 50. So I'm 50 inches until the outside of the next box. So what I want to do here now is grab another piece of tape. And the reason I'm using painter's tape is because this paint is actually hard enough that I can draw on it with a pencil without leaving a mark. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna get that on my mark here and there's 50. Okay, there's my 50 mark. If you think you're gonna have an issue with any kind of an obstruction, like this piece of trim that gets installed about here, grab your cover plate as well, okay? Confirm that you're gonna be all right. The other thing you can do is after you're done, before you put your cover plates on, you can back these screws off and you can square it off in case they're on an angle. That looks really cheesy, all right? So we know we're gonna be good here. Let's do the other plug over there. Confirm, and because we're using symmetry, I'm going 50 inches again. Is it exactly mirror image? And so there's my mark there. Okay. And so the same thing is going to be hold true. I'm going to be good. All right. Once you got that out of the way, 
it's time to set yourself up with a jig for installation. And I'm going to talk through the process so that you can understand how you can make your life really easy here. This is my jig. Um, we're going with a six inch gap between all of the boxes. So this is a one by six, which is not six inches, okay? <laughs> but it's close. And I'll show you later how I'm going to compensate for that. But the reason I'm going to use this is I'm going to use this as my center mark. It'll go on this line. Okay, I'm going to attach this to the wall with a couple of brad nails. And then I'm going to identify all of the studs on here. And I'm going to put the marks for where all of the trims line up. Okay? And this is how easy this is. Because we're going three inches to the first outside of the box. The box is 41 inches wide, plus that three takes me to 44. And then I've got six inches to the next box. 41 to 91. Now I'm going to just take this little carpenter square here, okay? I'm going to just draw my line across the whole board because I can install it this way and then I can take it off the wall, it's just a couple brad nails, reinstall it on the other side on my laser line I'm going to draw and these numbers all work on the mirror image over there. The reason I'm putting a line across is because the top and the bottom box are all the same dimension and the width. And this just makes it real easy to line it all up while I'm working and doing the assembly, help keep everything square and level. So there's my prong. I'm just going to put the C of the mark here so I know which part of the board goes where. All right, now. We're going to leave this line on for reference to know where the board goes. Now we've got to set the height. Now this height is actually going to represent the bottom of the top box. Okay? This is the key. My plan calls for a 27 inch box on the bottom with a six inch gap to the baseboard and then a six inch gap up here, which takes me to 27 plus 12, 39 inches. Right now I'm at 40 and a quarter. I'm too high. So we're gonna adjust our magnet. Now, here's the bottom of my, my magnet. I'm an inch and a quarter too high. I wanna bring my magnet down to that mark. Boom, perfect. Now I have all my lines. It's that easy, okay? Now we wanna find our studs because when we're doing this carpentry, we wanna tack all of the horizontal pieces of all the boxes into the framework of the wall. It's not enough to just attach it to the drywall, okay? So we're gonna start from over here. We're gonna go a few inches in, put our stud finder on the wall, hold it, and we're just gonna go across. Oh, there's one right there, how handy. We are going to have a little piece of tape handy. Come on. Here we go. Don't need a pencil for this. Okay. Next. Should be every 16 inches, give or take. And that marks the outside of the stud. And we're just rough tomating for now. Okay. Okay. So I put the tape on roughly where the stud mark was, right? But you'll notice when you're using a stud finder, you go to green and you come across, it'll turn red when it finds wood, okay? Which is off the green. To the other side, boom. So the difference between these two is actually the center of the stud. That's what I'm marking because I just want my nail to go in the center of the stud. That's all, okay? Um, the other thing is, I'm gonna be nailing just a few inches below the four foot mark, which is where there's a line of drywall. So there will be screws all along here, but not where I'm putting my board. So I'm not gonna have an issue where the nail fires back on off the top of a screw head, which is good. So consider that. You don't wanna have your horizontals where the drywall screws are. That'll drive you nuts. Now, I'm ready to install. Wow, I know, it's a lot of setup, but I've got a jig, I've got all my studs marked, I've got center lines, I've got everything laser leveled. Now it's time to fly. If you're looking for a great tool for your repertoire for trim carpentry, this compressor by DeWalt is, is a single tank, but it has enough capacity to run two hoses 
And I'm not gonna do hardwood flooring and everything else, but it is really nice and quiet. One of my favorite features about this is how quiet it is when it turns on. I've had a lot of compressors over the years. Uh, I've had Huskies, I've had Porter Cable, the pancakes. This is so quiet. You'll never go back once you use it. Right, check this out. Most compressors, if you turn them on, you can't even have a conversation in the room until it's done making its noise. All right, so the first tool that we're gonna be using for installation today is an 18 gauge brad nailer. All right, nails come in tracks like this. This particular machine, let's get that out of there. Just loads from the side, locked and go. Done, piece of cake, right? Um, now because this board is a five and three eighths and not six, I actually cut two pieces of five eighths off the end of it before I brought it up. So these are my spacers. Because when you're in a wood house, every movement causes a laser line to bounce around. That's called deflection. Here we go. I'm gonna put this on my vertical laser line right there with a spacer in two locations here. And then when I got everything where I want it, within reason, I'm going to take this brad nailer when that pencil is and I'm shooting a two inch brad into the stud. There we go. Let's just make sure that we're still straight over here. And we're ready to install. Done. <laughs> now we can start building our boxes. This is exciting. Okay, so here's my organization. These are all my, my horizontals top and bottom of both boxes. These are the, the verticals for the bottom part and these are the verticals for the top part. So, um, in order to install this, because of the horizontals we're gonna actually attach to the studs, you can see there's my, my box lines. Actually, I actually get three now, which is brilliant, right? I don't even need adhesive for the bottom. So, let's just get this laid out. Throw the, my spacer and my spacer. This is that easy. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I just loosen this. I'm gonna make that flush. Okay, now I got a square. So I can put the square right on that line. All right, and then just slide the trim over to it. Boom, as soon as I have contact, I'm in the right spot. That's it, that's all. And I'm gonna go through the meat of this material into the stud. Probably go sideways would be easier. Okay? Now, by doing this, of course, I'm gonna have a little bit of damage to repair, but that's it. Now that I'm on this mark, I don't have to touch anything. All I gotta do is throw in my nails. Okay, there we go. Next one. Okay, again, set that up on the pencil mark. Okay. Now, by supporting these blocks, all right, it helps to make sure that this is nice and level so that the corners are gonna be nice and square. Now the bottom is the easiest part because <laughs> it's already at the right height. We can do the bottom as well, and it's as easy as just eyeballing from here down. So I'm gonna bring the trim over to where that pencil line is right here, set it against the wall, Doesn't get any easier than that, all right? All right, so quick question for you guys. Uh, let me know, does using a template make a lot of sense? Or are you looking at that going, oh, that looks like it's a waste of time, I'm just gonna eyeball it. Because uh, I'll tell you right now, most of the videos that I've seen, there are people just eyeballing it. And uh, thank God they're on camera because it's really forgiving. But up close, not so forgiving. All of those husbands and wives out there, people making that project at home, they love it for the first day or two, because they're like, look what we did. And then the neighbors start coming over going, look what you did. <laughs> I'm just gonna do the template on the other side, and then I'm gonna show you how to do the verticals, and then we'll fly into a time lapse, and then we'll talk about how to finish the project off. So now we don't need a center line anymore. We're finished with that. Um, we don't need our stud lines anymore. This is exciting. We'll just clean up the wall. Now we're gonna to go to the verticals. The thought I just wanted to share here with you was the reason 
that I'm going through all the trouble to make sure that all the horizontal pieces are nailed into the studs is because when you build a wall, the stud package goes like this, okay? That's aggressive, but you get the idea. There's comings and goings. So by nailing it all tight to the wall, I'm doing the best I can to ensure that we're following the wall as much as possible so we don't have big gaps opening up, right? If this stud here was really deep and these two were pronounced and I just glued it on, I'd have a huge gap down the middle. Then you get into needing to use tons of caulking and no, you'll be here all day long and then over time it all ends up cracking on you anyway. So it's an outside wall four season climate, right? So by doing this, I'm nailing it to the frame. This will move with the wall as it moves with expansion and contraction. No caulking issues there, okay? This is why we're doing what we're doing. Seems elaborate, seems a little over the top, but it's gonna guarantee great results down the road. And it makes installation a breeze right now. So let me just get at it. I've got a few new tricks up my sleeve. So I'm gonna switch my gun over to my pin nailer. This is a 23 gauge nailer. That's the tiniest little nails ever. It actually has an arrow to show which way it should be pointing because there's no head on it that you can see. But there is a proper way to install. Now, this is to connect the material to the material, the vertical to the horizontal at the thick point off the side. That's all it's for. The way we're gonna attach it to the wall, I'm gonna be using this new construction adhesive by Lepage, um, no more nails. It's the clear, okay? The reason for this is I have a painted wall, I'm using painted trim. Whatever the adhesive is that I use, I don't want it to become visible if it squeezes just to the side near the edge. So using the clear means I don't have to worry about that. Also means I need to cut the tip off before I start. When you're gonna cut something like this, um, ignore the professional advice to cut away from you. Because if this catches, your hand goes all kinds of different directions. Instead, do it like you're um, peeling a potato. Put your thumb on the material, okay? and just slide. And the reason for that is, catch this, if my hand slips off, this, I'm not squeezing, I'm, I'm holding it still. I can't hurt myself, okay? Because this is my action. I'm using my left hand to move the material. And I didn't take enough. That's just awesome, we get to do it twice. There we go. A little safety tip for you, how about that? Mr. Not So Safe All The Time actually uses safety tips. I hear a lot from people about how I don't work very safe. But the truth is, with all the experience I've got in the industry, the amount of times I've been to the hospital, once, 18 years ago, just to get a little bit of glue because uh, they don't let us buy it up here in Canada. Or I wouldn't have wasted my time going down there at all. All right. Now, let's do verticals. We need, no more horizontal line, vertical. Now, for the sake of the camera, this is where this rig comes in real handy, because you're gonna wanna have it, if I want a line here, just set it off to the side. Here's my trim, here's my adhesive, right down the middle, okay? And not a lot. One thin little bead. I'm gonna put the gun on the plywood, just in case the material leaks. I'm gonna take my glue, and I'm gonna add it to the inside corner of this material here. Okay, not a lot. All right. The reason I'm using this is when, because I'm using adhesive, I need to install this on my line. Okay. You behave, you're supposed to grab better than that. We wanna get that material right where we want it. And we're gonna throw in a pin nail. This is the safety. And then you're ready to fire a nail. That's it, we'll do the bottom as well. I just go one pin nail in the middle. If ever there's a time for time lapse, it's right now. This is methodical. But we're just gonna go get all of our verticals done, following that same procedure, and then we can put all the rest of the horizontals in. Cheers. Now because this adhesive sets up pretty darn quick, I'm gonna just show you a little trick here. 
We're gonna take our horizontal for the bottom. I'm just gonna put a little mark on it where my nail goes because we're painting another coat in a minute anyway. All right, before that adhesive sets up, get down here and just put pressure on both of the outside corners. Everything's in the right location while it's drying. 10 minutes for that no nails adhesive to set up. It's gonna really cramp my style, so. I was just thinking to myself, I better read that construction because that's a brand new product. Anyway, there we go. Now I'm gonna get my ladder. I'll do the top as I go. I'm gonna do one box at a time. <sighs> Two more steps for us here. I'm just using the little pin nails. Looking to make sure I've got consistent gaps on the, all the verticals. Okay, they don't move as much as the horizontals when you frame. The material itself can come a little bit warped. So double check, make sure you're happy with the way everything's sitting on the wall. Give it a little push while the adhesive's still drying. Put the nail on an angle. Hold it in place until the adhesive finishes its job. Now I'm gonna switch guns back to the 18 gauge nailer. And I'm gonna finish nailing through the material into the studs on the framework on the, the horizontals, top and bottom. On the ladder. You can measure this off if you want to, right there. Come on. All right, now one quick step. Grab a pail and some water and a sponge and just go wipe all the glue joints. Make sure that you're not leaving residue. Okay. Say hello to my little friend. Little bucket of dry decks, okay? Goes on paint, dries white. Takes about 15 minutes in most conditions if it's a tiny hole. Uh, we have two holes. We have the holes in the wall because of the template. And then we've got the, the holes in the material from the 18 gauge nailer. The tiny holes that are in this trim from the 23 gauge nails, you don't have to worry about putting them. Just painting will close that all up. So what you're gonna use is the back of your five in one tool. We're just gonna look at drywall damage here. Make a bit of a dent. You can fill a dent. You can't patch a bump. Turn it around, grab some of the decks. All right, and just nice and flush. If you dent too hard, you're gonna need a second coat. So be careful. I'm gonna take what's left here. And I'm just gonna use it like a little putty stick to fill the nail holes on the horizontals. Anytime you use a 18 gauge nailer, you gotta fill those holes, okay? That's why I love having the 23 gauge. Now, if you don't have both of those tools, you can use the 18 for everything. It just means you're gonna have more holes to fill is all. If you wait until it completely dries, you've got to use a sanding sponge, or you can just take a wet sponge and do it now, and shape shape that putty, so then it, when it sets up and turns white, you're finished. Okay? Remember, the goal was to fill a hole. And I don't want to sand the trim because it's only got one coat of paint. I run the risk of sanding it right back to where it needs a second coat. So this is a great way to fill a hole and still leave the material on the wall. <sighs> Yeah, it's work, all right. Um, we're gonna let this dry for a little bit. Give it another 10 or 15 minutes while the adhesive sets up. Then we're gonna come back. Should have enough time for the dry decks to finish drying. We're gonna show you all the finished paint technique. Wow, what do you think? Let me know in the comments if you like this kind of look. All right, paint time. Um, nice and simple. We're just gonna go where all the touch-ups are. Make sure that we don't see anything white. And then I'm gonna cut the bottom and the top. There's a possibility that I might need a third brush line, okay? So we just wanna eliminate that risk of being disappointed with the final paint coat. So boom, 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 we'll just get all that done. Make sure that everywhere I look from every angle, I don't see any white, anything that wasn't painted, and then we will cut and roll the rest of this. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, there's a bit of advice here I should give you. When you're painting, traditionally with a wall, I fill my brush up and then I clean it off and I got lots of paint in the brush and I paint with it. But in this environment, okay, I want it less is more. It's so easy to create a drip when you're working with detail, right? So you want it to be wet, but you don't want it to be full of paint. It's kind of contrary to what I usually teach, right? You almost want to have to work to get that paint. So when I go across the detail like that, it doesn't just all gum up and turn into bubbles, all right? Let me give you a demonstration. This is how I would normally paint, all right? So I go in the corner. If you start painting like this, you're gonna have nothing but trouble, 
There's just way too much paint. It'll end up dripping all over the place and you won't be able to manage it. So fill your brush and then clean it and then you can do your touch-ups. Make sure that there's no white on the side of the trim because we pre-painted this right but we can cheat a little bit and make sure that the colors are really nice. It's almost like painting three times but you want to just be specific to where you're laying the paint out. Yeah, here's an, another example. I'm gonna have to babysit that corner for the next few minutes. <laughs> It'll just keep on dripping. Okay, so nice and dry. Any of these little pinholes, the 23 gauge pinholes, you might wanna just dab your brush in there so that you get the paint into the hole. And that's about all you're gonna need. Right, don't forget when people look at this wall, what they're really gonna be staring at is the woodwork. And so it's gotta be flawless. So even if you end up giving it a whole extra coat of paint, it's not gonna cause you any grief. All right, so we're just kinda like, almost like a Bob Ross technique here, just beat the devil out of it, right? Do that for the whole wall, guys. All right, and then I'll show you how to cut up against the ceiling in just a few minutes. So we're second coat now. Remember the first coat, I intentionally left a little bit of a gap because flat paint was on the wall, all right? Now that we have, um, I think this is an eggshell, we're ready to go. Able to, to paint a little bit easier without leaving all these nasty streaks, right? Now, we're gonna just push our brush into the corner. The secret here is to set your bristle right into that crack. Okay, and then just pull it along. Painting from inside the brush, if they can get this to work. It's a brand new brush, so it doesn't always work as nice. Okay. And then, um, when I'm done cutting the rest of the ceiling, I'm gonna pull out my mini roller and I'm gonna add texture to it so it has the same surface texture as every other panel. And so, the same thing, it's just like a ceiling edge when you're doing an inside corner, All right? Just set your bristles in the corner. And it would help if they did nice inside corners on the drywall work. So the plan is simple. We're gonna do the cutting. We're gonna mini roller all of this with a four inch roller. It's a six inch space. Okay, get the texture and then we'll do all of the trims and then we'll do inside the boxes. Okay, so now we got our cut in done. We're gonna take the brush. We're gonna cut all of our trim one more time. Give that a third coat. And we're also gonna cut about an inch above and below on each side of the wall. Then it's time to pull out the rollers. And again, less is more, okay? This is not time to get sloppy with the paint. <laughs> Mini roller, microfiber, four inch, piece of cake, right? I'm just gonna toss a little bit of this leftover from the can in there. I'll leave myself just enough in the bottom of this can that I can brush in it so it won't dry out. All right, let's start across the top first. We got to add texture to all of these flat surfaces. Ugh. Again, less is more when you're adding texture. We don't need to do a whole third coat, but we want to have enough that we don't have like a flat, shiny spot and then a textured wall underneath, right? Here we go. Nice and careful. Try to get as close to the ceiling as you can without making a mark. Flip it over to go down near the trim. Get rid of all those brush lines. There we go. We're gonna go all the way across the top and the bottom, and then we'll do the horizontal, and then we'll do all the verticals. <sighs> it's a long, it takes a long time to paint a wall this way, I'll tell you. But it's gonna look so good. <laughs> time to paint. I'm using an 18 mil microfiber. It carries a lot of paint. So it'll do two boxes, all right? So just make sure Put a good V on first, get the excess paint in one space, and then, here we go. Okay, and it's okay to touch the trim. Beautiful part about going with one color, right? Look at that, no brush lines now. They'll all disappear. Boy, I am loving the way this paint is covering. If you're not familiar with the C2 paint line, 
that I'm using here today, go and check out the uh, information in the video down below. Okay, we got a we got a relationship with them because they're selling online. They'll ship direct to your house all over the United States. Check it out because we've got a great discount for you. It makes a luxury paint like this very affordable. Wow. Today's shout out goes out to Karen. Shout out to Karen! Big project. Now Karen has been listening to the channel and she did what I was told to do to go make extra money on her home. She ripped off all the old clapboard and put on brand new siding. First time ever doing that work. Did an awesome job. That should empower a lot of people to realize that these tasks are totally doable. Check out us out on social media, Instagram and Facebook. Submit your pictures. Share with the world what you're up to, okay? Encourage the community. This is awesome. Proud of you. Cheers. Let's get back to the video. Quick tip, um, now that we're done, you're gonna see that when you work in a small area, you're gonna have a lot of these little lines. It's kind of like vacuuming a carpet when it's brand new, right? While it's still wet, just set your roller and just drag it down. Get rid of all those extra lines so that everything is completely vertical. So it doesn't end up screaming at you in different lights. Okay, that is a pro tip right there. Oh, oh, oh. <sighs> Bill and Ted, it's excellent adventure. Excellent. All right, well, she's all painted. Now we just gotta let it dry so we can put our electrical plates back on, get the furniture back in place. You're gonna have to wait two seconds. Check out this after shot. Ah, you know, anytime I get a chance to go working at my kid's house to help improve their quality of life, I'm all over it. Um, now this is starting to take place. They just gotta pick a color for the other three walls. So then their bathroom will be finished, the walk-in closet will be finished, the bedroom, the escape, this will be very serene. It's nice. Listen, if you like this kind of stuff and you like learning how to do things properly, no, not so they just don't look good for five minutes, so that they stand the test of time, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We've got lots of projects coming your way, all right? And if you haven't thought about this yet, think about joining our membership program. We can be here to help you navigate your renovation problems at your house. You can send us pictures on our public forum. We're here to help, guys. This is really it's what this channel is all about. We just want to help you be successful so that you can increase the value of your home, increase the quality of life, and learn a few tricks along the way. And if you're new to the DIY world, consider watching this video right here. It explains our brand new rating system for all of our videos on the difficulty scale and how many tools you're going to need out of 10. And this one's actually only a two, believe it or not. That's right. We can help navigate everything you're going to do in the future. Check that video out. It'll empower you to do more DIY. Cheers.